You know, I'm gonna give you a history lesson. We got some dumbass motherfuckers floating around this country. <laughs> <laughs> start laughing! <laughs> and when I do, start <laughs> Also, y'all did some nasty ass jokes on my ass, too. Funny jokes and unfunny jokes come out of the same birth. You fing guys are unbelievable. Evening, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Why You Laughing, a history of comedy podcast. And today, I am very pleased to introduce to you one of my favorite comedians of all time, the great Colin Quinn. And here to help me break that legend down is from the Blatcast and now from the new Who Are These Broadcasters, my sister show over at Who Are These Socials. It's Christian Blatt. What's going on, buddy? Hey, Mike. Uh, great to be here. Nice to meet you, Craig. And uh, hey. I, I insisted on coming on Why You're Laughing because uh, I think I'm the only person that Hack Ride has a restraining order against. So I actually <laughs> cannot appear on Blind Mike Project is my oh, is that? So, yes, <laughs> I'm yeah. actually surprised by that, that Hack Ride <laughs> hasn't embraced you. You seem right up his alley. But, uh, if I could, I just want to warn everyone for uh, next week. I was telling you, Christian, we have the great Drew Lane on from the Drew and Mike show. Everyone go yeah. check out the Drew and Mike show. And uh, I really bombed his intro, and it's been in my head ever since. We're recording these out of order. So I'm gonna, I need you to tell me that I nailed this one. I introduced you very well, right? Yes. You, okay. you mentioned the new show, Who Are These Broadcasters? <laughs> which, uh, speaking of bombing, our first clip uh, that we played on that show, uh, I got all tongue-tied and tripped over everything. And I'm like, oh, boy, it's going to be a long hour. But okay. uh, I feel better. I think, it, I think it went well. But you know how it is to do a show for the Who Are These Podcast Network, uh, Mike. The, uh, the fan feedback has been very constructive and very helpful. And everybody just wants me to know how much they like me, how much oh, they good. like Eric Zane, good, good, who's good. also on the show. Yeah, yeah. There's been there's been nothing negative uh, Excellent. since we've done the show. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Uh, so who are these broadcasters? Another spinoff of uh, who are these podcasts? You guys cover uh, things in the broadcasting world. Can people find that? Uh, I know you're going live on the who are these podcasts YouTube channel, but can people find the uh, audio version of that? Well, you know the trick that Carl likes to do when he launches a new show. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Whether people he want it or people not, into listening. Yeah, it, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> whether people want it or not, it's showing up in the audio feed for Who Are These Podcasts for a little while. So uh, just subscribe to Who Are These Podcasts and you'll get the audio version because there, there were people who wrote like, I can't watch on YouTube. I'm not a degenerate who can sit around and watch YouTube all day. Uh, where's the audio version? And, uh, you know, for those of us who uh, are Patreon subscribers to the to the, all of the uh, Blind Mike shows, uh, I Ooh. think uh, we appreciate the degenerates who can sit around and watch the YouTube videos with us. Well, if you're going to twist my arm, Christian, I guess I'll mention <laughs> BlindMike.net, where you can find the YouTube <laughs> channel, the Patreon uh, all of our free links to Blind Mike Project, Who Are These Socials, and Why You Laughing. And uh, if you want bonus episodes of Why You Laughing and episodes uh, a week early before the public gets them, make sure you subscribe to the Patreon. Uh, those will be available uh, for YouTube members as well if you want to become a YouTube member. Um, and the next bonus episode, it should be up by the time you guys are hearing this one. Um, if you want to check out the Patreon, you'll only be able to get it there. Uh, me and Craig will be breaking down the Rich Voss roast. And what reminded me of that is I have a clip from that uh, today. It's uh, one of the great roasts of the last few years, I thought. So uh, we'll be breaking that down on Patreon if you want to check that out. And uh, we, I also talked to Christian about doing uh, a bonus episode, possibly, because he mentioned to me the idea of doing Colin Quinn. And he also talked about remote control, which I didn't know a lot about. I know that's where Colin Quinn got his start. I didn't realize what a following it had. And you were sending me a bunch of clips. I didn't realize how much there was of it. I thought it was something that kind of like, you know, got on MTV. No, it, and it was Quinn huge. Got to start there, but then, yeah. Because uh, when you're of a certain age, like I am, uh, I remember when Remote Control started. And if if you can think of the world of MTV in like 1987, 1988, when it premiered, and imagine, well, what would a video, I'm uh, sorry, what would a game show for MTV in the late eighties look like that's exactly what it is. It was like for old, you know, people who'd watch a lot of TV reruns. So if you had a lot of knowledge about TV and Colin was on it, he had a segment called sing along with Colin, which you can, his voice was very different then, but uh, he was <laughs> yeah. as great a singer as he is now, but it also brought us the premiere, uh, the day TV debut of Adam Sandler, 
uh, and he was a regular character. He was in you know many episodes, and Dennis Leary was on. So yeah, it was it's surprising because uh, I was watching some of these clips, and I'm like, oh yeah, they they like acted a lot. They did a lot of like skits and vignettes. And, uh, you know, uh, Remote Control was definitely a, a show that I appreciated as a uh, middle schooler uh, right into high school. Well, we might as well start there then. Is that our first clip, Craig, talking about uh, Remote Control? Yes, it is. This is Colin Quinn kind of uh, remembering those days. Did you know what you were involved with on that show, Remote Control, when you were doing it? Did you sense it? Did you know that you're a part of something huge, pop culture, Colin? Yeah, well, at first we did it and we, me and Ken was the other guy. We were like over. comedians, so we were like, oh, my God, this show, you know, what is this nonsense? And then we started doing it. We're like, you know, it is fun. They let us do whatever we wanted. The, the guys, the producers, which was Mike Duke and Joe DeVoe, like they were so – like we were part of like the whole – Pause real quick, Craig. Not together. I, I don't fun. know if you would have any clue if this is true or not, Christian. Joe DeVola, is that where the Seinfeld name comes from? I, I think it must be. I actually don't know that for sure, but uh, yeah, every once in a while you'll hear you hear a name like that, and you go because like, Larry oh, used a lot of like Hollywood, yeah, not, not Hollywood names, but like you know people he worked with. No, I mean he, he, Kenny Kramer was a real guy in his building, you know, right. so for for Larry. So yeah, I, I would I would bet that it's like you know you probably got the real Devolo to like sign a release, and then you're like, oh, and now your name's on TV. You know? Crazy so. Joe Devolo worked for Remote yeah. Control. All right, continue. <laughs> Sorry, part of like the whole crowd of people that hung out together it was not there was not a lot of uh you know we just all hung out and and they just let you do whatever you wanted because they they didn't they didn't care they're like yeah do whatever you want on the show and then we didn't know how popular it was so we went to spring break that year and then we, so we shot it in december it was on for january february we're in new york it's cold and we don't really know and then we go down to spring break and thousands of kids start chanting every little line from the show and just even the commercials, they would imitate me doing the commercials. And we were like, wow, this is big. It's so amazing to me because legitimately Colin Quinn's in my top five comedians ever. Like, I think he's truly a genius and criminally underrated. But yet even I never pictured him uh, going to spring break and getting flocked with fans. I never <laughs> I never thought I knew remote control existed. I never thought of him as this like MTV kind of cool guy. And that's sort of the vibe you get when you watch. Uh, I think one of the, the next clips we have is him in that pirate's jacket on his uh, HBO half hour where he's like kind of trying to look cool. I don't picture him that way. It's so weird to me when I see those. <laughs> Um, there was uh, there was nothing more fun than uh, MTV Spring Break in general. And, yeah. uh, you know, when I was uh, trying to find some clips to send you for this show, uh, the, the the remote control Spring Break, uh, I was like, I, I might just watch this for fun, you know, <laughs> because uh, it, it's 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 definitely it's a it's like a it's like a flashback to a party. You weren't cool enough to be invited to, but <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. you still want to relive it. And that, that, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Because now we know Colin is this guy that talks about uh, the Constitution and all these big topics. <laughs> so you don't think of him that way at all. But uh, I was telling Christian before we started that uh, in that clip, you hear them mention uh, Ken Ober, who was obviously uh, on remote control and also a big part of Tough Crowd. I think he was uh, the head writer or executive producer. And um, in that interview, Rich Eisen goes, uh, now what's Ken Ober up to lately? And Colin goes, man, he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> Great so, interview moment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, Craig, where are we going now? Uh, we have Crocodile Dundee 2. Okay, so uh, Colin has a lot of great stories about his uh, mishaps in Hollywood. So um, Remote Control obviously kind of led to him getting SNL, although – in a way, that's a detriment. We've heard like Artie Lang talk about how um, being on Mad TV basically means you'll never get on Saturday Night Live. Um, so, like, Lauren doesn't necessarily like known guys. So, you know, Colin was a little known in the business after remote control, and he would get these small parts in movies that ended uh, hilariously uh, in, in various uh, instances. So, this is uh, his famous Crocodile Dundee 2 story. We're talking about Crocodile Dundee too, and the bad, the yeah. bad gang scene in that, and uh, how. Oh you, yeah, and, and mm. I relayed the fact that you had to, you felt you deserved a bigger part. Yeah, what, what you did, you did not actually approach anyone that had anything to do with this film and try to get a, a rewrite going, did you? 
No, no, I didn't try to get a rewrite. I wrote, I, I rewrote, <laughs> and my girlfriend typed up <laughs> um, the an entire rewrite of the second half of Crocodile Dundee 2. Me with the one line, the tuxedo onlooker. I didn't have a name. Onlooker. I rewrote it. Charles Dutton, who I didn't even I didn't know any of them. I just read the script. And I was like, this is not, this is not a New York script. I knew I had done comedy for like five months. I'm like, it's on my open mic. I rewrote the whole script, handed it in. Charles Dutton was out. And guess who was leading uh, Paul Hogan around New York? Uh, Colin yeah. Quinn. <laughs> It's it's truly it's truly genius, and it's a great moment where it's like that director or anyone that is reading that script is probably thinking this guy will never be heard from again. Not even like a you'll never work in this town sort of thing. It's more like this guy's so delusional that there's no way he'll ever make it, and that guy became one of the great comedians of all time. <laughs> like one of the truly brilliant minds is walking up to a director saying. Uh, I think the tuxedo onlooker should be the second lead in this film. <laughs> and and you're right about that uh, being a legendary story. The uh, the the last time I put together a prep for uh, Colin to be a guest uh, when Dennis Miller still had a podcast, uh, all I put at the top was ask him about these things: Crocodile Dundee two, yep, and the roast of Robert Robert De Niro. Oh, we'll get and, there too. We, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I, so it's like it's that. like he's got the like these two amazing stories, you know, and I think a lot of uh, comedians would kill to have one of those. <laughs> and he's like got these two great stories yeah. <laughs> just him being an ass. And there's something so like Colin was also uh he's been sober forever. He was a, a drunk in his early days and uh he talks about like going into dive bars and he would become sometimes Colum Quinn which was like an <laughs> Irish character he was doing when he was shitfaced or something and it's funny cuz when you hear a lot of these stories it is kind of behaving like a dry drunk in a way where it's like it's this massive undeserved ego but yet with Colin it's like he does kind of deserve that ego cuz he is brilliantly hilarious and still to this day should be bigger than he is so it's a weird uh, dynamic he's working with there. Yeah, no, e exactly. It's it's a it's a dangerous combination from what it yeah. sounds like. Yeah. <laughs> All right. What's next, Craig? Uh, next we have uh, his early stand-up. Okay, well, this about. is a, this is a clip from that uh, HBO uh, special that I was referring to, where he's in his uh, slick duds. All the world problems start with a dysfunctional family. That's the fact. Okay, violence? How does violence start? It starts with the family. It starts at home. Your father gets yelled at at work, so he's mad at his boss. So he comes home and yells at your mother because he's mad at his boss. Now she's mad at him, so she smacks you. You're mad at her, so you kick the family dog, all right? The dog is mad at you, so he goes out and bites the mailman. The mailman is mad at the dog, so he goes back to the post office and slaughters 14 of his co-workers. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, uh, that's also, by the way, I'm not saying like people stole directly from Colin, but I think a lot of the uh, stuff we play in regards to stand-up, it just becomes a thing. Like Colin thought of this bit. And then over time, like that became like a thing in sitcoms that I would see a lot where they would basically make that same. I remember how I met your mother legitimately had like an episode devoted to that plot line. So it's like that's the kind of mind I think Colin is where he comes up with these observations. He's, he's got brilliant analogies. And uh, I think we've got more that we'll play throughout the show. But he's able to put things in a way that are very, you know, I guess you could say highbrow or intellectual, whatever, but in a way that's palatable for like an idiot like me to be a fan of his, you know? Yeah. And I think that's why obviously a show like uh, tough crowd worked so well and why even to this day, if he's in the studio with Norton and Voss and they're all making fun of each other, you know, you Colin just, uh, you know, it's like, well, I, I think I could have had 10 years to come up with that. Uh, you know, yeah. like it's your turn to speak now. And I'm like, I wouldn't have even come close to that. So yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's impressive when somebody has, you know, they're not just quick, like, okay, you came up with a joke fast. No, you came up with the perfect joke really fast i mean know? the greatest example ever is when he called anthony kumi a back alley tunisian knife fighter <laughs> which right. like i don't to this day i don't really understand it but also <laughs> i can picture it and perfectly understand it <laughs> exactly <laughs>
<laughs> and uh, I remember, I, I think he used this on radio. And then, like, I thought of it when I saw Rich Voss in person at Skankfest one year. I was like, wow, he must have been wearing this outfit because uh, Colin Quinn said that Rich Voss looks like a Cuban domino player. <laughs> <laughs> and then when I met him, he was wearing the same hat and like bowling shirt. And I was like, wow, he nailed it. <laughs> That's Rich <Walsh. laughs> But yeah, he has the he has a, a brilliant, and it's something I, I always mention Gary Gullman when I think of this, uh, who is also brilliant at it. But shame on me for not putting Colin in that uh uh in that position more, where like he's a guy who's just his language I really respect. The vocabulary that he uses and the reference points that he makes are truly genius and the other thing that i noticed in that clip is just you mentioned it earlier but like the reverse pacino he has going with his voice where he has a smoker's <laughs> voice in the early 90s and now he sounds much gentler it's weird yeah, <laughs> yeah i know it's a he, he uh i guess he cleaned up his life and then uh cleaned up his voice as a result so yeah, yeah i've never seen it work like that but <laughs> all right what's next Craig? uh him getting snl Okay, so uh, SNL was obviously a big um, part of his career. That's where he gained a, a, a large portion of his notoriety, I would say. Um, but it was obviously bittersweet because he replaced the great Norm MacDonald. So this is the clip from uh, Stern, right? Yeah. Talking about that. Yeah. So he talks a little about getting SNL and uh, having to replace Norm. When you were at Saturday Night Live, you still had that cocky attitude? No, Saturday, here's what happened Saturday Night Live. I showed up at Saturday Night Live. You know, Fred Wolf was the one that said, Lorne, you got to see this guy. Lorne saw me. I bomb. So, I mean, one of the great bombs, even for me. According to David Spade, if you bomb, that's how you get on Saturday Night Live. They don't like a guy who's too uh, good. Well, yeah, we don't like, you don't like people that are just a crowd pleaser type thing. that right. Just overly accessible. You know what I mean? Right. Lorne likes a little attitude. You know right. what I mean? Edge. He goes, oh, yeah. So he's like, but he, I bombed so bad. He was even like, he even told me, he goes, well, you saved yourself from being in the, in, on the air with that one. You're just a writer now, you know? <laughs> Pause real quick. <laughs> yeah. That's so interesting to me because literally every, I just uh, listened to Shane Gillis was on with Spade and Carvey on the Fly on the Wall podcast. And he said the same thing, kind of that he felt like he bombed. And whenever I hear that, I think like, oh, these guys are being humble or they're comedians. So they have, you know, low self-esteem, all that. But is it, I, I had never heard the uh, Howard reference the David Spade thing. I had never heard that that Lauren kind of likes someone to bomb, where it's like it means they're not perfectly polished, you know. Yeah, I I do think you you need to crush your uh, audition in a way though, because uh, you know you can find the the Dana Carvey audition, the Phil Hartman audition, and uh, Phil Hartman brings Lovitz out for part of his audition, right. and you're like. You're like, well, yeah, of course, these guys got the show. You know what I mean? But right. yeah, I've heard that, too, though. Uh, you know, I I was uh, I, I was at the show in L.A. It was a, a sketch group and there was it wasn't Lauren, but it was Marcy Klein was there and uh, they wanted to you know, see everybody in there. One of the guys in the sketch troupe was Bill Hader. And uh, he was amazing, though. So yeah. I think it depends on what you're seeing. If somebody's doing stand up, you probably yeah. don't want somebody that gets all the uh, has all the laugh lines, you know? Yeah, I guess that's what I mean, is that like Tom Myers isn't going to see. I I'm sorry. <laughs> Lauren Michaels isn't going to see Tom Myers one night and be like, this guy's got it. He's my weekend. Look, update guy. If, <laughs> I was going to say, if weekend update with Tom Myers happens, uh, I am definitely tuning in every night. They'd have three I need viewers, to watch it at least because, yeah. because I'm going to need to watch it live. I can't yeah. just I can't just DVR it. I have to see it when it happens. <laughs> yeah. Um, before we get back to that clip, actually, uh, Christian is our first guest that's um, so much of a fanboy that he's legitimately wearing merch to show us that he was a, not only a Colin Quinn fan, but an intern at uh, SNL, yes. right? Yeah, so as uh, as we get into the part of the conversation where he talks about uh, taking over Weekend Update, uh, the, I started my internship in January of 1998. The first episode I was an intern for was Samuel Jackson with Ben Folds 5. And that's the first episode where Colin did Weekend Update. So it was a very weird vibe. Uh, I, I don't think that everybody in the office knew that was happening on Monday. I mean, I, I'm sure like Lauren's office knew uh, right. and uh, Colin knew at some point. But uh, yeah, and, uh, you know, they're, they, uh, Norm still had like a, a whole section carved out that had been the Weekend Update office. They just gave Colin a new Weekend Update office and he right. didn't have... You know, he didn't have Frank Sebastiano and uh, Norm's writers. They were still yeah. Norm's guys. 
And it, it's a very weird thing to have watched because Norm would be in sketches and he would show up before he left the show. And they would also, the writers would write those weekend update feature pieces where characters come out. Mm -hmm. And so in the read through, which they do on Wednesdays, and if you're an intern, you just get to listen from another room, which is like, oh, yeah, I'll stay late. I want to, I want to hear this. Yeah. Norm would basically be doing a character that in on paper, at least, it was something that he was supposed to be doing at the weekend update desk next to Colin. And I'm like, does anybody think this is actually going to happen? And they never put any of those on, but it was such a weird vibe. Oh, interesting. And I, I'm, uh, yeah. And I know that uh, at a certain point, you know, uh, Norm was obviously under contract through the rest of the season, but at a certain point that season, he just, he just left. It was like no reason, you know, he was like a game show host uh, in a sketch and stuff. So he turned up, but uh, he did not stick around through the end of that season. Well, we'll get more into that in a second, but let me hear uh, the rest of this clip with Colin because he's talking about uh, Norm. Yeah, know. he likes the most balls. <laughs> and then, um, but then he hired me, and then I was there for a while, and I started getting on the show. And Lorne loved me. I mean, Lorne treated me like Lorne treated me great there. Right, really great. I mean, I'm actually surprised Lorne hired you because you were on remote control. Yes, and usually he's looking for a complete unknown. And remote control did give you a degree of fame, a high degree of fame from MTV. Give me a high degree. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm surprised he wasn't like kind of, hey man, you know, you were on MTV. Yeah, he used to bust balls about MTV. He goes, he used to say, "This is not MTV." A lot. He would say that a lot to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do we have the Norm clip too? Uh, yep. That's Sorry, next. Let's, let's get right into that. Yeah, this one is uh, replacing Norm. He's talking. About. Yeah, so this is just more why uh, became he was uh, you know teacher's pet with Lorne, but it became kind of a weird environment there. Oh, I felt weird, like being, uh, like Lorne's, like being like the 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 favorite. Like I felt uncomfortable, and I shunned that. So I walk away from that. In other words, then, it's, it's uncomfortable being teacher's pet. So right. in a way, you want to, you almost want to be like the rest of the crew and not be singled out because the teacher's right. pet has pressure on them. And then, yeah, and you don't want to be that, even though you know it's a good thing, but in life, but you still have that old thing from when you're a kid. And then the norm when norm. Then I took over for Norm, and that was when I i feel like I even sabotaged it because I felt so guilty, even though I had nothing to do with Norm leaving. Right. But it was still, wow, I'm taking I'm taking Norm's thing after they fire him for this whole thing. Norm so was, Norm was an amazing, uh, amazing. anchor man uh, yeah. for the news. He, he was funny as hell. And what was so weird was he was dismissed as not being funny. It was a shameful kind of dismissal for a guy who's so talented. Yes. And then poor you, you're taking over for him and you have nothing to do with it. You didn't sabotage his job. No, I didn't. But I hung out with him the whole time. Right. He was one of your best friends. He was my best friend there. We hung out all the time. Did you call him and say, I know you just got fired. I feel horrible about this, but they've asked me to be the anchor man or did, were you just... I don't remember how it went down, but it was ugly. Not only was it weird. I mean, he was a real gentleman. I'll be honest with you. He was a total like a uh, gentleman. Like he made it, but it, but it was just so it was pathetic, you know, but anyway, it made me weird in that spot. The whole time I was there, it was just like, a, it was like a curse. In other words, like it's like you couldn't own it and enjoy I it. I couldn't own it and enjoy it. It's good that at least Norm was a good guy about it. Cause like um, the, the, what that made me think of is, uh, on the Kirk Minahan show, I asked uh, Mike Manansky about this, where um, Dale Arnold was fired from his midday radio job and uh, Mike Manansky replaced him. But Dale Arnold was still like around the station filling in and stuff. And if he was filling in, he would never mention Mike Manansky's name. It was we like you'd he he say like coming up is the midday show. Like, he wouldn't say the name of it. It was very weird and cringy. It's like you're blaming the guy that replaced you for some reason, even though it was obviously management that got rid of you. So it's this weird thing where it's good to hear as a guy that loves Norm so much, it's good to hear that he at least obviously didn't hold it against Colin and even stuck around in a weird way. I, we, uh, we did the firing of Norm McDonald was a very early episode of this podcast. And I was looking, I was trying to like match the dates up and I was like, was he on SNL? So that story that you told Christian, yeah, um, I didn't really know all the details where I was like, was he still there? What the fuck was happening? Yeah, was not like, through the end of the season, but I mean, yeah. I remember that uh, there was a, there was a sketch, and yeah, uh, yeah, I don't I don't have useful memories in my head, but I remember uh, a sketch from when I interned twenty five years ago. It was a game show called uh, 
you, you know, uh, are, are you grizzled? And you were trying to prove that you were like a mountain man and grizzled enough. And Robert Duvall was a special guest. He wasn't a host. And uh, Norm was there. And, uh, you know, uh, Robert Duvall looks at him and he says, well, I don't much care for you. And Norman character is like, yeah, yeah, a lot of people don't, you know? So he's like, he's definitely <laughs> like a lot of like tongue in cheek stuff, but it would be like, yeah, he'd be like in a sketch and that, in that premiere, that's that, that first episode where Colin does it, there's a, there's a bit, it's, it's a really funny bit of uh, uh, star, uh, star Wars auditions. And so they had been recorded at the beginning of the week. So Norm as Burt Reynolds is like, so this uh, Darth Vader guy, yeah. What kind of a car does he drive? And it's great. It's it's like you can probably find it, but SNL is like the weirdest thing to try and find stuff yeah. you remember, whether it's on Peacock or on YouTube. And so at the beginning of the week, Norm probably didn't even know he's getting fired, but then he stuck around for a, a little while. And uh, it it was a it was a weird thing because you were just like, I feel bad for this guy that like the it seemed like the only thing he really liked doing was Weekend Update, and now he's in these dumb sketches. Yeah. You know? Well, they were on Norm and Colin were on uh, Opie and Anthony together um, probably about 10, 11 years ago. So like 2011, 2012, something like that. Um, and uh, they talked about like the, the changing of the garden. I guess Colin and Norm lived in the same building at the time. And uh, Norm goes, uh, do you remember the time at the uh, at the elevator when uh, I was coming up and you were going down? And Colin goes the hell do you mean that happened all the time and norm goes oh it was poignant for me <laughs> in norm's mind it was this changing of the guard and colin was like yeah i just saw you on my way out of the building what are yeah. you talking about <laughs> but yeah i i um was very young at the time so i've only seen like you know uh, reruns when they were on e and comedy central back in the day and you know clips later on but from everything i could tell like colin was a great weekend update guy i just think he came after you know both your guys dennis miller who was there forever he was the longest running uh weekend update host at the time and then norm who was legendary and had more of this like cult following well so I yeah you you just for for uh to be factually accurate kevin neal was in between yeah, yeah, yeah. dennis and that's true uh you know neilan is great he's very funny and then by the time he was done with update i think he kind of found a way to make it work for him right and i think i would say the same thing for colin uh colin had great jokes i would say especially in his first one he didn't look entirely comfortable but the segment was very funny and you know he's still you know you're still having Will Ferrell wheel in, you know, in Harry Carey makeup and you still, you know, you're still having all this great stuff. And I, I think Colin was good. And, uh, you know, I think he just had that same problem though. Like you're saying, like Kevin Nealon, it's like, Oh, you're following this guy that everybody loved. Yeah. But with Norm, it was worse because it was like, you know, in the middle of the season, it was public that uh, they decided they didn't want him anymore. And but I mean, I do public, know he was talking about it on Letterman and Stern. Yeah. And so everyone knew about it. But from what I was told from people who had worked on the show, you know, at the time, it was like they had the numbers that the the show, the audience would level off starting with Weekend Update. There came a time where they only would have one song from the musical guest because they were just trying different things. They yeah. pushed Update a little bit later, things like that. I went to a, I, I had I had interned on Late Night with Conan O'Brien before SNL, so I was able to go to a dress rehearsal of SNL in november of 97 so only a few months before this and uh i do have a tape of it when you do the dress rehearsal for snl it's it's much longer it's like a full half hour longer so including weekend update probably had 15 20 jokes that don't make the air and you can literally hear on this video that i have i have it on vhs there are jokes that fall so flat there's one person laughing in the <laughs> audience and it's me I'm laughing hysterically. <laughs> and the fact that no one's laughing just made me laugh more. My friend who I was with was like, what's so funny? I'm like, no one's laughing. <laughs> you know? So, uh, yeah. So anyway, I think that they felt like, you know, and, and Lauren, from what you hear, is somebody that doesn't like to do the dirty work himself. Uh, right. No pun intended for Norm. Uh, but just, and so he was just like, yeah, let's make a change and let's see how it goes. And uh, rumor has it, they tried to, get Craig Kilborn to do weekend update, but he was under contract to do the daily show. Oh, and I can only imagine how that would have gone, but uh, 
that was, I think, their first choice was to replace him with, you know, to have, I guess, have had Kilborn still doing. I'm the looking to Craig. Craig Kilborn seems like an interesting guy. I know very little about him, but he had a weird career that I'd like to look into. Maybe we'll. Well, if you him. if you talk to people who worked with him, you'll kind of find one narrative. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. Uh, people were very happy when Craig Ferguson took over that show. Let's just <laughs> say that uh, that's what I hear. You okay. know, I, well, now I got to look into it. <laughs> yeah, you definitely want to look into it. Yep. All right. So we mentioned uh, Colin's first weekend update, and we have a little bit of that. And like I said, Colin is great at uh, descriptions, analogies, references, language, getting people to understand uh, exactly what he's talking about. And uh, he does that perfectly on his first weekend update. You know how you go to your favorite bar and your local bartender isn't there? You ask, where's Jeff? Jeff no longer works here. I'm Steve. And you're thinking, hey, who's this idiot? I like Jeff. But you still want your drink? And even though Steve doesn't mix your drink the same way you're used to, like Jeff, you still like the bar. You don't have to go to a different bar. And even Steve might feel kind of bad because Jeff trained him. <laughs> Jeff showed him how to work the cash register, where the tonic was on the soda gun, who tips, who doesn't. Well, I'm Steve. What can I get you? <laughs> such a such a, a perfect analogy, all the way down to like him f feeling weird about it, and also like the self awareness to know that there's going to be people that are like. Well, there's nothing else to watch at, you know, midnight on the Saturday night. So I guess I'll just watch this. Like his self-awareness is always, you know, on uh, Blind Mike Project, we pe we talk about people that are painfully uh, unaware of themselves. But here it always astounds me how aware guys like Colin are of what they're doing. Yeah. And, it, and it's, you know, somebody who is so funny in their own right, still feeling awkward sitting in that chair. You know what I yeah. mean? This wasn't like some fresh faced young comedian that, uh, you know, had uh, just, uh, you know, gotten past at the comedy uh, cellar or whatever, yeah. you know, and uh, and still Colin's like, oh, this is so weird because everybody loved Norm so much, you know, yeah. and uh, I yeah, I I often think about how perfect that intro was for like, yeah, I know. I, I don't I, I, I'm surprised to see me here, too. I know you're expecting Norm, but here I am. So I guess let's drink together. And uh, yeah, yeah, that's it, that's that's one of those perfect moments in the history of SNL for me. I think. It's really the best possible way he could have done it because it's not a it's not an unacknowledgement where you pretend nothing happened. It's not an over the top. Uh, you know, weeping for Norm or anything. I think it's not only like perfect for who Colin is, it's probably perfect for what Norm would have wanted out of that, I think, you know? Um, so yeah, I, I really liked it as well. But uh, there's another moment that we mentioned. Uh, Harry Carey stops by that very same uh, weekend update, right? Yep. If I was a scientist, you know what I would clone? Hot dogs. <laughs> really? <laughs> Think of all the possibilities, Norm. Imagine. <laughs> world. Hey, what's going on? Imagine. Hold on. Imagine a world of, of, with an endless supply of hot dogs. You could have a hot dog any time you wanted. Well, Harry, you could do that pretty much now. They'd be so abundant, they'd become our currency. <laughs> 20 hot dogs would equal roughly a nickel, <laughs> depending on the strength of the yen. I'm not quite sure, but you know what? I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's just keep praying that we can clone one of these hot dogs. Uh, all right, Harry, what else happened in 97? Hey, Lord, did you gain weight? <laughs> <laughs> Again, uh, actually, I was wondering, you might have a little more insight into this, Christian. Was that, you think that was improv by Will Ferrell? Because it seemed like. If it like was it... improvised, if he was improvised, he did it in dress rehearsal. Uh, oh, okay. So, yeah. So, uh, it, and, and that happens sometimes, you know, that, uh, yeah, let's keep that ad lib in. Uh, on very rare occasions, like if a sketch like goes really wrong in dress rehearsal, like a, a wig falls off or something like that, yeah. they'll actually air the dress rehearsal version instead because they're like, this is too funny that it, it all went to shit. But uh, yeah, uh, a lot of that stuff. Uh, Lorne is not big on improvisation, which is probably something you've heard. Yes. It's uh, literally what got Damon Wayans fired from the show. 
was that he would improvise right. uh, because, you know, he didn't want to read the cue cards, basically. And he right, thought right. that, you know, Dane Wayne's a very funny guy, but uh, Lorne and uh, everybody there, I think, felt uh, they knew better. But yeah, uh, yeah and, and it's it's the, the those are the two things that I think about when I think about Colin on Weekend Update or his speech and, hey, Norm, did you gain weight? <laughs> you know, and it was just, you know, we were just the, the other interns and people who work on the show who don't need to have any business to be in the studio. We were just watching upstairs and we're just like, this is this is hysterical this is great that they're they're self-aware enough and they're not trying to pull a fast one on you and being like oh yeah this is colin you know colin he's always right. been here at this desk yeah right well that's i when I, I the reason i left so much of that clip it is that i loved the hey norm and then you know he veers off back into the topic and then he goes hey norm <laughs> like, <laughs> he wants a response out of him it was very funny it's great um all right oh and uh Speaking of uh, Christian's time at SNL, he really wanted to pull his dick out and uh, measure it here, and so we have sure a, did. A, yeah, we have a joke that he got on the air. Well, and 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 the reason I pulled it is because it is the only joke that I ever uh, sold uh, to SNL, yeah. uh, and. I, it, I think to me, it says a lot about Colin taking over a uh, weekend update yeah. and the fact that I was an intern and uh, uh, Scott Weinstein, shout out to him, who was the weekend update coordinator and still is actually, he was, uh, he said, yeah, it's fine if you want to submit jokes. I'm like, really? Ooh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was not something that uh, we got to do at late night with Conan O'Brien. So uh, yeah. And it got so that I would get the, the, the packets that the writers got and I would send jokes and, when the jokes would be printed up, at least at that time, they were each on a page and it had the last name of the contributor because you have people on staff who did not get paid extra for jokes, but outside contributors, uh, Dennis Miller, I think would pay $25. Norm would pay 50. Colin paid $100 for a joke and it was a personal check. It was some like writer's guild reasoning, you know, that right. the show didn't pay for it. So he just paid you personally for the joke. So, and Colin, you know, would be like Christian Blatt because he knew my name because he would always see it. And he's like, what are you writing jokes on? And he would tell me like, uh, you know, we're looking for more on Lewinsky or, you know, whatever, you know, he felt like he didn't have enough jokes on. He was very encouraging and uh, he would always talk to me about it. And that's how I got to know him at all. And to this day, I, I do still uh, communicate with Colin once in a while. It would be to have him on with uh, Dennis Miller or if I'm trying to get a comp to one of his shows in New York, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, then I, then I reach out. But uh, so there is a, a joke. I did only get on air one time. I did get a hundred dollar check from Colin Quinn Ooh. and people would ask me back in, this was actually in the year 2000 and people would be like, did you save the check? I'm like, no, it was for a hundred dollars. I cashed it. I needed it. But, yeah. <laughs> but I did make it. I made a Xerox of it. So I have yeah. a copy of it somewhere, like, but I'm like, yeah, no, of course I'm going to uh, cash the check. Yeah. And uh, it's, yeah, it's years of submitting jokes. I continued to submit after this to Colin, to uh, Jimmy and Tina and uh, never got anything else on. I think I had some stuff in dress rehearsal. You don't get paid for that. But this is my shining moment where I sold a joke to Colin Quinn. But I I, I did want to show it because, one, I wanted to see if you guys think I'm funny. Yeah. Two, uh, the joke may not have aged as well in the last 23 years because of a word in the punchline. Um, and then uh, also, I thought it was just interesting to talk about, you know, Colin was not somebody who's like, no, I'm only taking jokes from writers. And yeah. Dennis Miller was the same way. Dennis actually working on his TV show, the jokes were just numbered. And then he would say which numbers he didn't want to know who wrote anything. He's just like, whatever's funny is going to make it on the show. And uh, I, yeah, I, I, I built a career out of uh, not having my name attached to my work. The, uh, the truth of it is Christian reached out to me and said, do you think we could do a why you laughing episode about this joke that I got on SNL? And I was like, what if we did Colin Quinn and just included the joke? Would that make more sense? <laughs> as like, long right, as the joke is on, I said I would do it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's hear it. I at the U.S. Comedy Arts Festival in Aspen this weekend, Lifetime honoree Jerry Lewis stunned the audience by declaring, quote, I don't like any female comedians because I think of them as producing machines that bring babies into the world. Lewis then spent an hour discussing the finer points of his own comic genius, like falling down and making fun of retarded people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, take that, Jerry Lewis. <laughs> It's a hot take right there. It's actually spot on, too, because we did an episode about Jerry Lewis, and we have clips of him saying, like, yeah, fucking broads aren't funny. 
Oh yeah, no, those that those were big comments, and uh, <laughs> that was one of those ones. I'm like, I'm like, uh, oh, that was on the show. Like nobody else wrote that joke. You know, it just it seemed so obvious to me. Right. And uh, yeah, it was. Uh, it, it was it was definitely a great feeling, and uh, I, I I love that uh, Colin gave me one hundred dollars, and I've gotten more than a hundred dollars in comps uh, to see his shows in the years since. But to your point about Colin, like trusting your stuff when you were just an intern, like that is the kind of stuff you hear about Colin a lot. And the story that it made me think of was just um, how involved he was in trying to um, like help Artie Lang get sober. And yeah. I've heard Joe List say the same thing. Like Joe List, who got sober ten plus years ago, said like Colin Quinn would like reach. And Joe List was nobody at the time. Colin Quinn would like go out of his way to like make sure he was doing okay, talk to him when he needed it, all that kind of stuff. So it is like a pattern that Colin seems to have had throughout his careers. Career, uh, not just young guys, but guys. I guess Artie would be a little more of a peer, even though he's younger than Colin. Right, but uh, you know, Artie definitely needed a, a yeah. helping hand, and uh, some would say uh, uh, still does. But uh, just yeah. a quick anecdote to only reinforce that point. Yeah. Uh, my friend Adam Wade, I was a page with him at, at NBC, and he ended up uh, being an intern and then a production assistant on Tough Crowd. So he got to know Colin really well, and he has been a comedian for a long time. And he asked Colin to evaluate some of his work. And at that time, Adam was telling stories. And then he had like these parody songs that he would write. And Colin was just like, you're really funny. You should lose the songs and just tell the stories. That's the best part. And so then Adam kind of went on to be, you know, there's a, there's like a, you know, a a fringe like storyteller comedy community in New York. And Mm -hmm. uh, Adam's a big part of that. And he teaches storytelling classes and stuff because Colin was like, you should put down the guitar. You know, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, you know, and some people don't want to hear stuff like that. What do you mean? I learned how to play guitar. I'm an excellent player. Right. You know, uh, I'm better than Carl. Uh, <laughs> you know, some people don't want to put down the guitar, but, uh, uh, sure. you know, and, and it's just like to take the time to, you know, to even talk to a PA and even watch their tape. Yeah. You know, it's uh, it, it always said a lot to me uh, about Colin. Well, even with Tough Crowd, if you look at like not just, you know, interns or young guys, whatever, even with Tough Crowd, the idea of having the cast essentially be Geraldo, DePaulo, Norton, Keith Robinson and Patrice O'Neill, like Comedy Central ended up loving Greg Geraldo. But with the exception of him, these are guys that uh, not just Comedy Central, but the industry was never too keen on. And Colin <laughs> was like, well, these are the funniest guys I know. So I'm putting yeah. them on the show. Colin so magnanimous. He even tried to help Dat Fan get laughs. I mean, he did. Know. Yeah, we talked about that. I know. Yeah. <laughs> um, Do a French uh, accent. <laughs> uh, here we have him uh, talking about the uh, De Niro birthday party. Okay, so yeah, this is uh, the story that Christian mentioned. We have a few clips with this because he's uh, actually again to mention Artie Lang. He's on with Artie Lang. Uh, explaining this, so he would do um, when Bru. Correct me if I'm wrong here, Christian. When Brewer was doing Pesci, Colin would usually play De Niro, right? Correct. Yes. And yeah, so he was known on SNL for doing this De Niro impression. And uh, so the De Niro camp reached out to Colin. And uh, let's hear about it. This is everything that's wrong with me, this story, by the way. I took it like Ralph Crampton. I'm like, I'm not going to do four minutes. I'm going to do 20 minutes. Oh, no. Oh, sorry. I should have set it up better. I'm sorry. Um, so Robert De Niro's wife reached out to Colin and was like, Hey, can you basically give a, a, a speech at, uh, Rob's, you know, give him the business a little bit and just, uh, go up and, uh, talk about Robert, make some jokes and, uh, I guess, you know, warm up the crowd at this birthday party that we're having. I, I get in 20 minutes. You understand what your Sorry, husband remember. means to me and people like me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to make this a tribute like you've never seen. Oh, so you can do the sappy shit too. Not all like all funny, but sappy in the right, middle. Right, yeah, it was right. gonna be a it was gonna be a because you like, don't do sappy. No, it was gonna be like a Peter <laughs> Allen type thing, okay, you know. Right. Like I go up and down, <laughs> smooth. You, yeah, know you mean? mean? <laughs> <laughs> so Colin had these uh, visions of grandeur in his head, saying that this is gonna be my shot. I'm gonna, you know, people are gonna be weeping. They're gonna be rocking and reeling and hanging from the ceiling at this De Niro birthday party. And that's going to be his in in the industry. People are going to respect him after this. Yep. But he uh, unfortunately broke the rules as he's about to tell us. <laughs> yes. So I rule number one, I go to a, I ignore what she said. So already 
I broke rule number one. Yeah, she just wants Shorter you to do four minutes of the fucking four impression. Four minutes and get out. Yeah, yeah. Three minutes. Right. 30 seconds, probably. Right. <laughs> so I go there to the restaurant, Le Cirque. 30 so seconds. There, it's just getting dark. And the waiting staff, I feel bad for the waiters. Like, they're like, hey, I, I, yeah. here I am doing this thing. And yeah. I'm making it's a very difficult actors. thing to do, man. I don't care how I experienced you are. Yeah, good money to do I'm si No money. That's second. She, up, she goes, what do you charge? I go, nothing. I charge for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Uh, no, you, you, nothing. Yeah, because this is going to be... This is going to be in my mind. Also, the time Scorsese's there in my mind. And he's going to be like, "How did I miss this guy?" This is a bigger <laughs> deal than getting <laughs> for a car. Like I, the, the, yes. yeah, the, I mean, to be asked Absolute, to do that, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And so I go up. Now, rule number two that I break, and he already knows all my all these years of comedy. Rule number two, she goes, "I'll introduce you." Oh, good. And I go, "No, don't oh. introduce." Me. <laughs> oh no. I'll just go up cold. That's 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 Push. crazy. So now you've <laughs> <laughs> so in Colin's mind, legitimately, he's playing Nicholson's role in the the, the Departed. Like he's he's like, this is my shot, baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's very similar uh, to the story, the Crocodile Dundee story, where he's like, this is what you got to do. You take your shot. And what's hilarious about it is, and like unfortunate in a way, like in a way, he's right because there's a chance this goes well. And it's like, hey, Colin, how'd you become best buddies with Bob De Niro? It's like, well, let me tell you, you know. <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, it didn't go well for him, and he started bombing. Uh, okay. Fortunately for us, though, Craig. Yes. Yeah. Instead of going up, I couldn't memorize it because it's all stuff about De Niro. Yeah, 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 yeah. I make sure there's a uh, like a podium. I lay out four sheets of paper on the podium, right. so, I I can might, refer, so I can refer to the notes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, so now bad. you're Jenny, now you're Jenny Garofalo. Now you're Lenny Bruce. We need to sport transcript. Yes. <laughs> so I go up. They're still talking. I go, hello, everybody. Uh, now rule number four. I break. I go. I don't. I'm here to talk about Robert De Niro. I don't know him that well. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, these are his friends. Yeah. These are his friends. Why would somebody? Uh, and then I start trying to roast him. I go, De Niro. I know his movies. I I slam him with a couple of jokes about his bad movies. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, that's good. The place is like, then I try to turn on Chris Walken his ass. So I try to turn on him and roast him. <laughs> he seems like a maniac who might have killed Natalie yeah. Wood. Right. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I mean, Chris Walken, I love him. But the only thing the worst crazy. I could have done was a Natalie Wood joke. You're right. right. Thank God. I guess it wasn't as bad as it could have been. Yeah. Anyway, in about, in about two minutes, I realized this is bad. Yeah. But I won't give up because in my head, I'm like, no, this is my, but, this is my even night to shine. That <laughs> my night to shine. And it, I mean, we'll talk more about Tough Crowd in a second, but like that's what I think resonated with Tough Crowd so much is that Colin is fully capable and kind of like revels in it a little bit the amount of joy that Artie is getting from this story. Like this, this horror show that Colin is portraying at De Niro's uh, birthday. Artie is loving it. And that's really what Tough Crowd was in a nutshell, where it's these guys busting balls and there's really no other host that I can think of in television that would allow himself to get as abused as much as Colin did and laughed at like that. <laughs> yeah. But it wasn't, it wasn't so bad. Here he is talking about years later. After. Yeah. So this is uh, years later and Jim Norton thought it would be like a fun thing to bring up. Uh, they, Robert De Niro was at the comedy cellar a lot because they shot that movie. The movie was called like the comedian or something like that. It bombed. It was a, yeah. Colin could have put that in his speech at the, at the time. <laughs> but uh, uh, so he's at the Comedy Cellar a lot, and Norton and Colin Quinn are talking with him. But they didn't tune away. They're just kind of talking to each other like they, it's his birthday, so they're trying to be respectful. Yes, yes, so yes. Just, it's he not, thinks, they, tuning they, out would have been better. It. And now they Grace Hightower is probably going like, what did I do? Her and De Niro are just looking at each other, and she's oh, trying to explain. It's oh, just oh, ugly. Oh, yeah, but was, Colin, you, you don't know what industry people are thinking of people sometimes, too, though. Yes, except there. here's how you know, because because I you know I told that story and I was like, oh, you know, years later I was like, you know what? Maybe it wasn't quite as awful yeah. as I thought it was. And then me and Norton run into De Niro and Grace Hightower outside the, the great Jim Norton, right? Yeah. yeah, we went into her outside the cellar when he's researching that abominable com comedian movie. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> so we're talking for a couple of minutes. We're all having laughs. Said they're cool. Yeah, we're, yeah, yeah. And then Norton goes, "Hey, remember when he bombed at your birthday party? Oh, and oh no, their faces darkened." But Their eyes got so angry that even Jim to this day but, admits it was that traumatic to them. He too. was trying to bust your balls. <laughs> he said that was even a little too much. 
they when he saw like, the reaction. Like, it was faces. clearly a tragic moment in their life. I mean, 10 years, they've been around the world five times since then, <laughs> and it's still... <laughs> <laughs> It's so great that they remembered, not only remembered, but weren't like, ah, you know, who cares? Things happen there. Yeah. Like, Water oh, under the oh bridge God. there, Colin. <laughs> uh, by the way, I'm glad that uh, we got uh, some input from a noted showbiz insider, Mike Bachetti, in that clip. Thank God uh, he <laughs> well, was Colin, able to You never that. know what industry people are thinking. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, Mike. Usually they're thinking uh, we're not going to hire Mike Bachetti. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, it's funny too, because it's like, that's what uh you know if you have ever been in like therapy or anything you kind of try to learn that where it's like that's something i've had to try to be better at is like hey you know what in it probably wasn't as big a deal in their minds as it was mine like colin we got to that healthy state where he's like in reality how much do they even really care about it and then he has the moment to confront that and they're like you know honey let's go Let's get out of here. <laughs> we don't want to deal with this guy again. Don't you know I'm friends with Seinfeld? Please don't leave. <laughs> but um, uh, next clip, we have him talking about a, a movie role that he uh, turned oh, down. Another hilarious failure in Colin's life. Again, we're talking about these moments. He is like one of the greatest stand-ups of all time, but some of his uh, industry decisions were haven't been the greatest. You turned down the part of Scott Evil in the Austin Powers movie. That that has to be a regret of, or that had to be a regret of yours at the time. Well, at the time, I was, I, I mean, I do have bouts of delusion and uh, grandiosity. <laughs> probably, you know, I'm sure there's a, I'm sure there's a psychological disorder that that fits my my behavior. But I had written this movie, and in my mind. My movie, which never got made to this day, by the way, was oh my God. I was going to make it. I had nobody saying it's going to get made. So that's why it's a delusion. So <laughs> Mike Myers goes out of his way to hunt me down my number. This is before oh you God. can just get someone's not, you know, late yeah, 90s. Yeah. I'm on SNL, but I'm just writing on there. And he says, I saw you on Larry Sanders playing the sun. I want you to have this part sight unseen. You're the sun. <laughs> I go, Mike, thank you. Good luck with your movie. <laughs> he goes, well, this will only be a few days. Mike, I need to concentrate on, and he understands the business. He's like, but that's not going to interfere. What are you talking? What are you doing? Why are you doing this? And I'm like, Mike, why are you doing this? Why are you pressuring me when I just told you I'm busy? <laughs> I'm so, did it, I mean, just, can you imagine? Just no. no I was in the business no. for 10 years, no. 12 years. No. There's no excuse no. for not no. knowing what to do. There's something you're wrong. killing me right something now. You're, 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 this, this story is actually killing me. <laughs> Even fucking, uh, you know, uh, Sugar Plum Andy Cohen is horrified yeah. by it. He's like, dear God. <laughs> Why would you do that? <laughs> but it is hilarious. And it's, again, that, that attitude that he has that I... I do think it's like worked in his favor in a lot of ways where it doesn't allow him to do things he doesn't want to do. It doesn't allow him to be corny. Uh, it's prevented him from, you know, um, having a lot of moments that comedians have had over the over the years where they end up taking themselves too seriously. I think that instinct that Colin has has prevented any of that. But it has also thwarted many opportunities that he's had over the years as well. <laughs> You know, I was just thinking that uh, I assume he doesn't still have his copy of his rewritten Crocodile Dundee 2, but no. hypothetically, if he does, think about if he were to have like a fundraiser of a staged reading of his Crocodile Dundee 2, how much would you pay to see that? I'd fly oh back to New York God. just to go see him read that. You know, I would, yeah, I would love yeah. to see his Crocodile, you know, just hear what he thought in 1988 his Crocodile Dundee 2 should have well, been. Even just if they could do, and I, I in that um, O and A thing we were talking about, they asked him if he had it, and he said no. He threw it yeah. away. But um, just a, a table read where it's like you know him, Norton, Voss, all those guys <laughs> right. like, having parts would be yeah. brilliant. <laughs> yeah, and 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 Norton would have to be Crocodile Dundee and be like, "Yes, we want you to do the accent, Jimmy. Please, please do your Australian <laughs> accent." <laughs> all right, what's next? Uh, next, uh, we have him talking with Jim and Sam about uh, Tough Crowd. 
Yeah, so I didn't pull too many tough crowd clips because we uh, have a tough crowd episode. If you want to go back into the archives, go to uh, blindmike.net, listen wherever you get podcasts, or search through the YouTube. Uh, an early episode we did was about tough crowd. Um, so I didn't pull a ton of that stuff, but we do ha- have a little of him talking about um, basically why it never came back, resurrected anywhere. There's such a fake rebel, uh, you know what I mean? Like they create these fake dragons and then slay them all the time. You know what I mean? Like it's such a, it's such a fake world. And then they're like, we're going to go up against it. Yeah. And what are you going up against? You know what I mean? You and created like, it. Yes. Like what are you, how are you fighting conflict? But they want to see themselves as edgy. You know, everybody wants to show me. And they're like, we want to see ourselves as going against the power. Even and that, speaking truth and, to power. And I know he's and not wrong because of the notes we would get. Like I would and tough crowd, the notes you would get would be very all in line with that. Like, you know, they let us be kind of rough on tough crowd. They let us get away with a lot, but the yeah. notes we would get were always the so- only reason they let us get away with it is because we blitzkrieged them. We surprised That's them true. with what that show was gonna be. From the beginning, it was almost like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And so it was really just trying to trying to Plug up like a dyke the whole time. <laughs> you know what I mean? We did bliss trigger. That's a great way to put it. It was, it was, it was, it was even we didn't know where we were going. You and Patrice and me and Nick, and it was like Geraldo and fucking yeah. Ke- like everyone's fired. What are they going to do? Beep the whole show? Like they couldn't edit the whole show. No. Right. 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 They just had to find a way to get rid of it because you- uh, it was just, it was, it was, even we didn't know it was going to be like that, really. I mean, we knew we were- It's interesting that the industry, for whatever reason, has never, or maybe it just, because of fear is the reason probably that they've never been able to capitalize on that audience. Like there absolutely is an audience for tough crowd. Maybe you could argue it's more niche than the daily show was, but like there's certainly an audience for it. And people, comedy fans to this day ask Colin, why do you bring that? Uh, That whole segment that I pulled that from is Norton trying to convince Colin to bring tough crowd back. And I think he's just a guy uh you know kirk minahan is a lot like this where like when something's done it's done you hear him talk about with a lot like the old guys from his show why he doesn't bring them back necessarily like there's a a mindset i think a very respectable mindset it's like once you're finished with a project it's over i think colin at the time maybe would have liked to see it pop up on hbo but now when you hear people ask him about it it's even like hey like no one's calling me but it's like they could have done it as a podcast if they wanted to but I think Colin's like, you know what? The time for that, for me, has passed, I guess, unfortunately. Yeah, and it's also like, you know, yes, you could get a different group of comedians and do it. But, uh, you know, obviously what you're going to want is, you know, the comics you know the best, you know. And, you know, DePaulo's off doing his own thing. You know, Norton's very busy now, and obviously Patrice isn't with us. So you're already doing a copy of a copy. You know, Colin would still be there, and I'm sure if – You know, Colin wanted to do anything in the podcast realm. I'm sure it'd be very funny, but uh, I think it's like, no, you don't want to try to, uh, you know, approximate that thing that everybody remembers as being so great, you know, and then have it be shitty, you know? Right. Yeah. And I think that's, that's where he's very wise in a lot of ways. And even just about podcasting in general, um, he, he hates podcasts. He he'll go on them and even still talk about how much he hates them. And he says, what's fascinating about this generation is that we try to get people in trouble for things they say. We try to find things that people have said that we don't agree with and get them in trouble for it. And simultaneously, we record and broadcast every single thing we do all day, every day. <laughs> uh, he, he, he is a guy, sorry, Craig. Um, he is a guy, I think, that will end up like Carlin in the sense, and, and Hicks might be even a better example, where I think 20 years from now, you're going to be playing a lot of Colin Quinn clips saying like, boy, this guy knew where the world was going, you know, 20, 30 years ago, whatever. I believe they did um, uh, a tough, like a mini tough crowd reunion at some festival. I forget at which Skank one. Fest. It's Skank Fest. I was there. I've yeah. been, I've been to all, but I, I didn't go to the first Skank Fest. I've been to everyone since. And I was there for uh, Louis. The first time he came back on stage was at Skank Fest. And, the tough crowd reunion and i was not in the room for either one (laughs) (laughs) we were talking about how busy everyone that was on the show that's still with us is yeah but i know for a fact at least apollo he was furious he wasn't notified that that was happening 
So yeah, yeah, yeah. Put that, that wasn't even on television. It was a nothing thing. If they put yeah. that on TV, anyone who's anyone in that industry would be trying to get I on. do think those guys would have gotten together, and I think you could have made it work, but I think, like Colin said, it, it's just not – possible no i, I Either, look i think i think you could do a one-off you could do a reunion yeah. like you're talking about but not a, a a weekly and i mean that show was what four days a week you would yep. never do that i don't i don't think that anybody wants to go out there and do it every week but yeah i i do agree that uh and that's interesting that that sounds like to paula that'd be like why the fuck didn't you call me yeah but, uh <laughs> well the, they, they yeah. invited him to the festival and he said no Oh. So they were like, well, I guess he can't do the reunion. <laughs> and then we found out there was a reunion. He was like, fuck them. He was all pissed off. Yeah. He was so, very yeah. mad. Yeah. Um, well, that, 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 that's also unlike Apollo to get mad about something. <laughs> it's weird. Yeah. And, and, it was and a rare share his feelings. Him. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, no, that, well, that's the thing too, is like tough crowd is a show. I'm sure we said it 50,000 times in the tough crowd episode, but it is a show like, okay. Yes. If you did it once a week and made it a podcast that a rotating crew of like, the old guys like Norton and Bob Kelly and Keith Robinson, whoever, um, and you know, newer guys like uh, Nick Mullen and Joe List and Shane Gillis and all these people. Like, sure, I think that could work. I don't think Colin wants to organize that on his own. And I think if you were to bring it back on Netflix or HBO and it was what it was at the time, if it held up to that standard, either it wouldn't be as good as it was, or if it did hold up to the standard that it was at it would eventually get canceled because the industry wouldn't allow it. Yeah. Colin doesn't want to come back and do the Netflix season of Arrested Development. You know, exactly. It, yeah, yeah. That's the best way to put it. Um, next, we have him roasting Howard. Uh, yeah, this is uh, so like I said, we're doing the uh, Voss roast on Patreon. By the way, Christian, am I taking up too much of your time? Do you have to be out of here? No, no, no. I can uh, right. I, I can always uh, talk comedy with you gentlemen. That's oh, fine. Thank you so much. <laughs> um <laughs> So, yeah, I, I wanted to show how good of a, a roaster Colin is. We're doing the his set was tremendous at the Voss roast. It was. And I was like, I wonder if he's done any others. And he was on some of these uh, Howard Stern roasts. I think this is the roast of uh, Artie. This one's from. <laughs> but Howard, I listen to you every day on satellite. Why don't you say how great it feels to be able to say whatever you want one more fucking time? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. After all 23 years of being oppressed, okay, you weren't Nelson Mandela. Get over it. <laughs> hey, I never was happy. Really? We feel like fucking idiots and laughing at the show for 23 years. So never fucking happened. <laughs> yeah, thank God you broke free so you're not censored while you analyze Taylor Hicks. So you're living for the silly, you faggot. <laughs> Living for the silly. The roast is over. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think Gary hired that homeless guy to attack you so you'd have something to talk about on Monday besides dancing with the stars. <laughs> Nobody's laughing harder than Gary. <laughs> he did like that one. <laughs> well, that's what's great about Colin is like he was a stern show regular and he was kind of part of that world. And he's a rare guy that's not afraid to go with the king and make fun of Howard like that. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, you know, look, there's plenty of people that were on both shows that were, you know, on ONA and on Howard. Uh, yeah. But uh, there's there's not as many where you feel like they fit in perfectly on both shows. You know, you can Correct. say, you know, Norton would be a perfect example. You know, like he would never have fit in as well with Howard than he did with uh, Opie and Anthony. And no, uh, Patrice, yeah, Colin's Patrice one of those rare ones. really fit in with Howard. Yeah. The one or times he was on yeah yeah right um, exactly but by the way the best thing about that clip was uh seeing howard stern laugh when someone said something uh bad about him i'm like oh i i can't imagine that that's happened at any point in the last decade possibly yeah, more those were the days yeah <laughs> nope but yeah part of the reason i included that clip is i did want to talk about the fact that colin had such a good standing with howard stern and opie and anthony and it was pretty rare like the Paolo was on both jim florentine was on both um fairly regularly and there were guys that, but no one as much like colin quinn was a staple on opie and anthony so especially towards the end um but like guys that fit into both where colin was you know trying to get eric the midget to uh remake taxi driver like he was gonna write the script for a remake of taxi driver starring eric the actor and uh and and also with like Opie and Anthony, he was the reason for um, like uh, the Lady Die internship and classic bits like that. So he was integral in both. And uh, what I always loved 
for a time on ONA was I guess he lived um I think when they were in the original XM studio, maybe he lived right down the street from them. So he would pop in uh, like when he heard something that, that bothered him, like, I guess Jim Norton was doing an ad read once and he mentioned like friends of that. He's like, it was for Caroline's or something. And he's like, you know, David tell going to be there. Andrew Dice Clay. And I guess Jim goes, uh, these are all theater acts, like trying to promote them. <laughs> and Colin Quinn leaves his house to come into the studio and roast Norton for saying that. <laughs> they're, he, uh, they're all he suffered no act, fools, they? Colin Quinn. Yeah. Um, but uh, next we have Cop Show. Oh. I mean, this is criminally this is a criminally underrated show. Yes. I thought the best clip to use to tie it together was what I think is a, a tremendous uh, SNL reference, but. Um, Cop, go guys, go watch the whole series. To, pause this and go watch the whole show because literally there's six minute episodes. You can go watch all three seasons right now. Um, but it's a brilliant show. It's another thing that Colin did that I don't understand how it never got picked up. It's mockumentary style, like The Office or you know Modern Family, Parks and Rec, any of those. Um, and for whatever reason, uh, it didn't reach the right people. But like, it's one of my favorite things he's ever done. Well, it's a lot of pressure working there because all people do is talk about how great you were. It feels like I'm following your shadow. Well, I was just doing my job, fella. And I <laughs> left of my own accord. I wasn't forced out over the summer. Okay, uh, cut, everybody. Um, do you hear it, too? It feels a little weird right now, right? Yeah, I think the job it feels heavy. Like right now, it's just a little on the nose. Yeah, but the guy's a great cop, and then he gets replaced. Right, he gets replaced, but that's the. He's whole... irreplaceable, but he's replaced. Right, but the, the the whole SNL angle with the Weekend Update thing yeah. and him now having the job oh, oh, the job. Job. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> you didn't know that that's not the joke. I yeah. thought it was you know, oh, no. that's the Sad. whole. Th I can't see how you could have written this. Well, and the problem was I, I wrote it, but I, I probably was I was in the middle of writing. You know, I have the interns come over and do the work for me. No, you know? I, I and, don't uh, know that. No, you have the interns do the work for yeah, you? Yeah, like whoever's the newest, youngest interns, I, I pluck them out and have them come over to my house. Specifically the youngest. Yeah, bring them over Sunday afternoon, little picnic set up and have them do some work. But I must have improv. Well, you know, well, these I'm kids so, are like, I'm oh, sorry. everything you say goes in the script. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the typing is not the problem, it's the words. I <laughs> so, so he's playing uh, this like David Brentish character, and I think Colin's so great at that. And there's also a sketch from um, uh, Inside Amy Schumer where he has to play like just a conversation, like a regular Joe on the elevator. And he, he's so great at that role, like just kind of being a delusional asshole. And it's because he's not that at all, and he's able to to make fun of that and mock it in such a brilliant way. And that's what that show does so well. And it's got like great kids, like Seinfeld was in it. Schumer was actually very funny in it. Uh, Seth Meyers was in an episode. Gaffigan. There's a bunch of people. Uh, Norton's in a bunch. DePaulo's in a couple. Um, and yeah, it was never able. It, was, it didn't take off anywhere, but it truly is a brilliant show. And it's such a shame that it never got made. I agree. Um, if only uh, if only it had, had uh, come around at the time of Quibi, if uh, you guys right, <laughs> yeah, I know yeah. <laughs> that would have perfect for Quibi, yeah, would have been perfect. But well, uh, you know, it's funny you say that because in a weird way, it was a little ahead of its time because what Colin did is he just shot these and basically like put them online to see if it went anywhere, kind of the way like Gillian Keeves did the first season of the sketch show. Yeah, if Colin had done Cop Show like eight years later and just put it on YouTube. I think that might've been more impactful as far as like getting more made because that was more of a thing in a weird way. He was uh, too innovative by putting them like just, you know, kind of crowdsourcing it the way that he did. Um, next we have him talking about social media. Uh, okay. Yeah. This again, another one of his uh, brilliant analogies, I think. Remember when the internet started, we were all Positive soccer moms. Everybody's posting pictures of unicorns, sunsets, rainbows, inspirational quotes. Make yesterday, today's tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's corny, but look at it now. Stay in your lane. Keep my name out of your mouth. Die in a fire. 
<laughs> and I'm old, you know, I grew up offline. And in those days, if you wanted to have a political debate with somebody, you couldn't do it in your underwear. <laughs> you had to get dressed, go down to the local bar, pick up the newspaper, find somebody you knew disagree with you politically. You'd be like, you like this, don't you? <laughs> and they go, as a matter of fact, I do. What's your problem? And then you have a debate with his friends, family, people you knew from the neighborhood. So the bar itself was Facebook. <laughs> and Twitter was all the strangers doing coke in the bathroom together. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking in short bursts of under 280 characters. <laughs> paranoid, like, yeah, why are you following me, huh? <laughs> Trying to send me a message? I'm watching. Reddit was the regulars at the bar that were there too often, so they noticed things no one should ever notice. <laughs> I was watching all the time. Did you change the taps on the IPA? Okay, that's enough, Eddie. <laughs> And the troll was the guy in the corner asleep who just lifts his head up every three hours and go, everybody here can kiss my ass. And like, All right. <laughs> just such brilliant observations. And that's what I'm talking about. Like when I think of uh, Carlin and Bill Hicks, where Colin has so much material, especially in these one man shows, that's from a uh, red state, blue state, which I believe is his most recent um, that he's filmed. Uh, and like, it's just such a, a brilliant hour i mean they're called one man shows it is basically stand up he just ha he's focusing it's the same as i said about like ari shafir's jew where it's like i get it. technically yes it's a one man show because he's focusing on one topic it's straight stand up like it's all jokes the whole time um but he's such he's so brilliant at breaking down a subject like that like who would ever think you'd want to watch an hour about the constitution <laughs> <laughs> you know what i mean but colin does it in such a way where it isn't boring you know, it's not it's not this dry thing where even if you're not into history or, you, you know, you're 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 still interested. No, those those shows are great. And, uh, you know, getting to, uh, you know, go and see them. And obviously most of them have been filmed. Uh, it's great. Just, uh, you know, when you're giving credit to Colin, don't point out that he is now a theater act. I don't think uh, <laughs> they're all theater acts. <laughs> <laughs> well, and uh, one thing, I don't have anything uh, with him in Seinfeld, but um, shout out to Jerry, because I've been critical of Jerry on this program in the past. But I do have to say, one thing I've always respected about Jerry Seinfeld is, and I said this when we talked about him, that like Jerry, for all his faults in his uh, philosophy on stand-up, the one thing I've always respected is that he doesn't judge people that aren't like him. In fact, he embraces them. Right. And he has executive produced everything Colin, Colin has done from yeah. Tough Crowd to all the one man shows and even Cop Show. He was a big part of. So he believes in Colin very much. Uh, big J actually has a great roast joke about Colin having pictures of Seinfeld getting an abortion in Missouri in 1988. <laughs> but. <laughs> but um, it is it is uh respect to Seinfeld for you know showing so much faith in what Colin does. Like I, I that I've always appreciated about. Um what else do we have, Craig? Uh this last our last clip, it is uh Joe DeRosa roasting Colin at the Voss Roast. Yeah, so this I just figured was a good way to cap off the uh discussion of his one man shows because that's kind of what he's known for now. I know he has a, a new one that he's working on. I heard a lot of comedians um talking about seeing the premiere back a few months ago actually uh quick aside there was a great story that came out of uh colin's premiere of that show where i guess uh joe list and uh chris de stefano were there talking to each other and seinfeld walks up and he knows de stefano and he goes hey chris and he shook his hand and joe list is a massive uh seinfeld fan so jerry walks away and Joe List does like a little fun thing where he goes, give me that hand. And he starts like smelling it with the Stefano. And uh, Mike Cannon leans in and he goes, you know, Jerry saw all of that. <laughs> I was like, that's a Seinfeld moment. That's hilarious. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so like I said, I love Colin's one man shows. I think they're brilliant. Um, I think more people should check them out. But uh, Joe, De Joe DeRosa does have a great roast joke that does sum them up in a very funny way. At one time, one of the great 
comedians alive. Watch his recent specials. He now sounds like the teacher that likes to have a good time with the class during the lesson. <laughs> Stop trying to show us learning is fun, Colin. <laughs> I'll tell you what's fun. Sitting around with a bunch of comedians and shitting on you on Netflix, stammering your way through the history of the automobile. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so we'll have fun uh, breaking that down. DeRosa crushed in that roast, and uh, Colin did as well, so we'll break that down on Patreon. But I thought that was a hilarious summation of what – it's so funny because, like, legitimately, I think what Colin has been doing with these one-man shows – is one of the more brilliant things done in stand-up in the last 15, 20 years, I would say. Easily. Like, truly, I believe that. And yet, like, one of his buddies is able to just minimize it to Colin discussing the history of the field <laughs> to make learning fun. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. <sighs> All right, Christian, anything you think we missed on uh, Colin? Qu- I mean, there's a ton we missed. We're going to eventually do a Colin Quinn part two, I'm sure. But uh, anything you wanted to add before? We yeah, no, I mean, it's it's interesting. One of the things that he talked about was, uh, you know, because he bombed, he got hired as a writer on SNL first. And Spade was also hired first as a writer. And you'll find a lot of people who, uh, you know, it's shocking to think that uh, they weren't immediately put into sketches. But uh, it's very interesting the way things work there. And uh, I, the only thing I wanted to end on was uh, your point about Carlin or possibly Bill Hicks, I think is, is spot on. And, and Hicks probably is the better comparison because by the end of Carlin's life, everybody pretty much knew who he was Sure, and he was great. And Bill Hicks got huge, but he was never even close to the status of where you're like, you know, he's one of the funniest guys at least right. of his era. And most people don't know him, especially now, you know, people aren't right. going to like, Oh yeah, I've heard of Bill Hicks. So, you know, that could very well uh, be, be Colin underappreciated, even though he's got the Netflix specials and, and everything. So, uh, yeah. but hopefully well, he uh, does reach Carlin status just in case. What, what is it. interesting about him is he's like the one guy from that tough crowd comedy seller crew that, and this is kind of a, a comparison to Howard a little bit. When I think of Howard versus Opie and Anthony, what Howard was always smart with was he was able to navigate the industry and the business a lot better than Opie and Anthony were. He was smarter at not getting fired, basically. And Colin, I do think, was a lot is a lot better than obviously like Patrice and DePaulo, but even guys like Norton at you know kind of keeping connections and no like. You know, you'll see Colin on, you know, late night, like the, the tight show and all that kind of stuff. So he he is better than the crew that he hangs with at doing that. I just think part of the reason he's not as well known as he should be is that he has that muscle in him that will not allow him to be corny, to be douchey, to do anything he's not 100 percent comfortable with. So the reason that I don't think he's as famous as he should be, I think totally respect and i'm glad that that's in him because he wouldn't be the same guy except for his twitter account where he's intentionally corny and it's a lot of like lol oh, even mention the twitter account <laughs> yeah, his twitter account is amazing it's part uh, two he's the greatest twitter follow ever yeah, yeah. 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 part two definitely <laughs> <laughs> definitely have to seriously do- folks <laughs> <laughs> folks all right yeah, no, we'll definitely do a Colin Quinn part two at some point. Christian, I hope we have you back at some point as well. Thank you for joining. Yeah, absolutely. I was, uh, I, I enjoy the show, and uh, you know, only once in a while do I feel like uh, I need to reach out and uh, fact check. And there's a lot of stuff. You know, I was always more of a stern guy than an open Anthony guy yeah. uh just because you know especially when they were on at the same time you kind of had to sure. pick one and uh so the the o and a standalone ones are my favorites because i'm like i've never heard this before there's a lot yeah. of stuff i've heard of and i've heard since but uh and uh, you know even fun stuff like revisiting uh richard Pryor on the sunset strip so uh i enjoy the show and uh despite what carl says i like craig and uh you know <laughs> hack ride the verdict is out but uh don't don't come at me <laughs> well th- thank you sir and since christian was so kind to me with those words make sure you check out uh who are these broadcasters uh part of the who are these podcast network but also the blackcast right where they can where can they find all your stuff christian you can go to blackcast uh b-l-a-d-t-c-a-s-t on youtube and uh there is an uh, audio version and, uh, you know, for people who are WATP adjacent, uh, we did have a recent episode where we reviewed the Christopher Nolan film Oppenheimer and we did a straight review for about 45 minutes. 
And then we had everybody's favorite Muppet, Tukey, pop in, who Ooh. had uh, <laughs> who had not watched the movie, uh, but wanted to talk about it anyway. Uh, I've done episodes with Cardiff, and I, I did do an episode with Carl where I presented him with the first episode of my podcast from 2013, and I said, have at it. And boy, <laughs> did he ever. Oh, so, uh, yeah. I'll have to check you can, out. You can find all kinds of stuff like that uh, over there at the Blackcast. B-L-A-D-T-C-A-S-T. And I'm on social media at Christian DMZ. This is uh, one of the first shows where I'm saying, I'm on X, y'all, at Christian oh, very DMZ. Cool. <laughs> Can't do it. Can't do it. Yeah. Well, just as a quick aside, we played a clip of OJ, uh, OJ Simpson on Who Are These as opposed to I the heard, yes. Guys. Yeah, so on Who Are These Broadcasters? And, you know, he always famously started, hello, Twitter world. Well, he's like, hello, X world. And we're like, I oh, my believe- God. I was in stunned disbelief. Yeah. <laughs> Can't Stop believe the it. presses. Since when does he listen to the rules? <laughs> he's, well, he started now, Craig. You know, maybe he's maybe you can teach an old dog new yeah. tricks. He's matured <laughs> in his seventies or whatever. He is. Um, yeah, so go follow Christian everywhere. Uh, go to blindmike.net if you want to support this show, as well as Blind Mike Project and who are the socials. All the links are there. Join the Patreon. Become a YouTube member, whichever is easier for you. Um, we appreciate the support. And uh, go to verygoodshow.org. That's where you can find all Craig's stuff. Uh, Craig is actually doing an event. Just send him money and he's going to buy a bunch of tickets to a concert. And then he'll <laughs> update you on the details later. Uh, it all, Believe me, he explained it to me. It all checks out. So go to verygoodshow.org for that. And uh, we will talk to you guys next time on Why Are You Laughing? Zip it up and zip it out. Yeah.